meeting, we are privileged at Congregation Lador Vador to have joining us in discussion, someone who has done so much for the state of Israel, someone who is totally dedicated to Israel, and we're so pleased that he decided to share some of his time with us. Mort Klein is the president of the Zionist Organization of America, and we are pleased to have him with us. My father, Rabbi Sam Silver, was very involved with the Zionist Organization of America. He loved ZOA, dedicated countless hours to it. And as his son, it's great for me, a congregation of Lador Vador, to have him with us. Uh, we're going to get involved with uh, two discussions. We originally decided that we definitely wanted to talk about an issue of critical importance to Israel and therefore to Jews all over the world. And that is the exercise by Israel of sovereignty over 30% of Judea and Samaria. It's commonly referred to as annexation, but Mort Klein does not want to use that term, nor will I to describe this. We'll use the terminology that he approves of, and we can also let other people weigh in on this. A critical <laughs> issue, that's usually and very often debated and discussed in an irrational way where people adopt partisan lines, where people don't stick to the facts and people yell and scream and get angry at one another. That won't happen here for a few reasons. One is Sharon is very meticulous about keeping things in order. She doesn't allow things to get out of hand. So I know she's gonna do a great job. The other is that Mort Klein is also a very rational, clear thinker, and he's one who knows how to discuss things in a very even-handed way. And the other is that I'm sure that all the people who are joining us are going to be very calm and well-behaved. However, we also have the benefit of being on here by Zoom, which means that if somebody gets unruly, rather than have to try to get, take them out of the room, we can just mute them which is a really wonderful benefit. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking this is a really good way to discuss very, very controversial issues. Now, as if the exercise of sovereignty in, by Israel in uh, Judea and Samaria, 30% of it is not controversial enough and people want to add more controversy, we decided to also get involved in one of the most explosive, one of the most irrationally discussed issues that I can think of, and that is Black Lives Matter where just, this, just the mention of the name starts getting people angry and upset one way or the other. And so we're going to discuss Black Lives Matter. And uh, also from a Jewish perspective, their, their relationship with the Jewish people, and also whether they're a positive or a negative influence in the world. This issue now is front and center of the news. And that's why it's great to have people here joining us. I thank everyone for joining us. And now that I've given this very lengthy introduction, I'm just going to add one more part to it. I'm going to turn it over to Mark Klein for him to share some of his thoughts about this issue. The other is that you're coming from Congregation Lador Vador. We're a congregation committed to rational Judaism. We believe that Judaism should be infused and guided by prophets, by our traditions and heritage, and also by science. And so we merge the two together to come up with a rational approach. We also believe very strongly in social action, that Judaism should lead to action on critical issues in the world. We are devoted to interfaith action, and we are devoted especially to free speech and to have all different points of view. We do not, part, we do not tote a liberal line or a conservative line or any line. We believe in Judaism and Jewish ideals and facts and we let those facts and ideals lead us to wherever they might end up. And so that's why it's a pleasure. We're also doing a Friday night. I think it might even be available now, but we have a Shabbat celebration every week, which is uh, guided by this rational approach to Judaism. I call it cosmic Judaism. You can tune in on the website of Congregation Lador Vador anytime on Friday, usually. It's probably up there now. And, and join us in Shabbat. If you think what I'm describing is some kind of weird, wacky, way out approach to Judaism, give it a try and you'll find out that we love our Jewish heritage, we love Hebrew, we love Jewish ideals, and you will be inspired. 
Now I'm going to turn it over to our <laughs> wonderful guest, to Mort Klein, to please share whatever thoughts you would like with all of us here on this audience. Mort Klein, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Rabbi. I'm, uh, I, I'm honored to be here with the son of one of the distinguished past leaders of ZOA, your honorable father, Rabbi Sam Silver. Uh, you mentioned scientific. My background is actually in math and biostatistics. I spent 20 years working with the greatest chemist who ever lived, the two-time Nobel Prize winning Linus Pauling, uh, the greatest structural chemist who ever lived. And uh, <laughs> I view myself as being a rational centrist. Uh, in other words, the positions we take are based on the facts and truth is not a political position. So if the facts lead us to positions that others call right wing, it is actually a rational centrist position if that's where the facts lead us. Uh, so if you want, you, if you would like, I'm not sure about exactly the format, you know, I'll, I'll start speaking about whatever you wish me to, uh, but I appreciate uh, all the people on the uh, pre-July 4th uh, weekend to be uh, on the call with us for these two very important issues that affects uh, the Jewish people, very much affects Israel and really affects America and even the world. Uh, so these are critical issues of our time. Well, Mort, um, I, I do want to thank you for joining us again and also for sharing your background. Uh, this, this passage that we're reading this week is Hukat, in which they sacrificed a sacred cow, a red heifer. And so here, uh, Lador Vador, we believe in sacrificing all the sacred cows. And instead of just repeating something because some political party or some partisan group says so, we believe in just letting the facts speak. So I really appreciate what you had to say about that. Mm -hmm. And I hope that everybody on the line will be able to try to become independent on this Independence Day weekend from prior mm -hmm. preconceived notions and just let the facts speak and let's have an honest discussion. And let's try to do this also. Let's have every person on this Zoom connection agree that they are willing to let their views be shaped and perhaps altered by what they're going to hear. That's so important, otherwise we're wasting our time. I make that commitment that if, if Mort says something or anybody says something that contradicts what I used to believe and there's a good reason for why they're saying it and there's evidence for it, I'm willing to alter and adjust my beliefs and I hope everyone else is too. So we have two major issues that we're gonna talk about. That is the exercise of sovereignty by Israel over Judea and Samaria, 30% of it, and also Black Lives Matter. Let's start out with the, uh, the first topic about Israel. Um, Mort, I'd like you to speak on the, this topic, and I'd also like you to speak, I'm sure you will, on why you do not approve of and agree with the, the common vernacular where it describes this issue as one of annexation. Mort, go ahead, talk to us about this important issue. Look, it's just a matter of what the words mean. Annexation means you're taking over someone else's sovereign land. And uh, Judea and Samaria has never, ever in history been sovereign land. There was never a country, an Arab country or any country called Palestine. Palestine was a region and Judea and Samaria was called Palestine because when the Romans captured Judea and Samaria from the Jews, they renamed it Philistinia to stick it to the Jews, to give pain to the Jews that they named it after the Jewish, the Jewish arch enemy of the time, time, the Philistines. So this was never a Palestinian Arab country. There's never been any Palestinian kings or queens. So uh, annexation is simply inaccurate because it's not taking over anyone's sovereign land. And when Jordan controlled it from 48 to 67, only two countries in the world recognized that. They illegally occupied, Jordan did, Judea and Samaria. Sovereignty <laughs> means uh, applying uh, the law of, of the land to an area that really uh, the arguments are clear is it belongs to Israel. Uh, religiously, historically, politically, uh, legally, <laughs> Israel uh, 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 has the rights to this land. And by the way, this is not having declared sovereignty has been really a century long injustice to the Jewish people. The international law from 1917, 1920, 1922, the San, San, San Remo Resolution, the League of Nations Covenant, the British Mandate, UN Charter, uh, Article 80 in 1945 says those rulings stand that all of Judea and Samaria is Israeli land legally. So this has always been Israeli land legally. 
Uh, and uh, there's also, it's very important for Israel to maintain at least these areas, 30% of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley next to Jordan for security reasons. The top military experts say by, by uh, controlling these areas, Israel will be able to protect itself by itself that these are defensible borders. If Israel doesn't control these borders, that, then Israel is nine miles wide. It could be split in half in a war, very, very dangerous. A thousand top IDF officers have signed a letter saying we need these lands for security. And only uh, this week, uh, Avi Dichter, uh, the, the head of Shin Bet and the Nas National Security for Israel said, we must apply sovereignty now for security reasons, in addition to everything else. <laughs> And Jewish history also makes it clear this is Jewish land. Uh, Jews are from Judea. We are Judeans. Jew is a contraction of the word Judean. Uh, uh, Arabs are from Arabia and Northern Africa. Uh, there was never a Palestinian state. Mark Twain, when he went to Judea and Samaria in the late 1800s, wrote an essay, a long essay, Innocence Abroad, saying the land is empty. There are no people here in the late 1800s. The Arabs started coming here when the Jews came, uh, started uh, developing the land in order to get uh, jobs. Jews have lived here forever. The first Jews are Abraham and Sarah. They lived in Judea and Samaria. Jewish King David was anointed and ruled in Judea and Samaria. The Jewish prophet Jacob slept and dreamt in Judea and Samaria. The Jewish prophet Joseph lived here. The Jewish Maccabees, for God's sakes, their base was in Judea and Samaria, and there were Jewish kingdoms for hundreds, even thousands of years <clears throat> here in Judea and Samaria. And, and if Israel controls these areas, they will protect all religious sites. When the Arabs take over an area where there's Jewish or Christian uh, religious sites, they destroy them. Israel will protect them. <laughs> and let me tell you, I've spoken to top officials, both in the Arab world and the top Israeli world, they made it clear. There was tacit approval by Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates. They said they'll publicly criticize it, but they'll go along with it. So there's no problem with the, the moderate Sunni states. They will be supporting this. And the European Union, which is condemning this, they need Israel's world-class high-tech equipment. They cannot end relations with Israel. They need the high-tech equipment that Israel provides. It, Israel is world-class in this uh, high-tech equipment. <laughs> and as a rabbi, <laughs> you, should, we, you should be acutely aware, and as you are, that this is called the promised land. Who promised the land and to whom did he promise it? God promised the land to the Jewish people. That's why it's called the promised land. And even the polls, uh, there are several polls that show overwhelming support in Israel for, uh, for uh, recognizing Israeli law over these areas. And even in America, in the recent World Zionist Congress elections, 120,000 American Jews voted, and 52% voted for the right of center groups who supported sovereignty over this land. So even American Jews, when they voted, uh, voted for, uh, for groups supporting this. And Jordan, by the way, people forget this. They publicly relinquished their claim to Judea and Samaria in 1988. Uh, king, uh, the king of Jordan then said, we make no claims to it. So Jordan relinquished it. Now is the time, especially if Joe Biden becomes president, and I've known Joe Biden for 25 years, and I will tell you that his staffers were the most hostile to Israel of any of the staffers I lobbied for 25 years. And Joe Biden uh, uh, has already stated he will not allow sovereignty. <laughs> he will reverse the Iran deal and, and go back to it. Uh, he's not a friend. And many of the people he's already hired in his campaign very hostile to Israel. That's why it has to be done now when we have a friend of Israel in the White House, uh, 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 President Trump. <laughs> and a big thing, so many people say, if you declare sovereignty, this will ruin the chances for peace. How absurd is that? For 27 years, really 72 years, Israel has not declared sovereignty of those areas. Has there been peace? There's been no sovereignty. There's no peace. And there's no peace because they the Palestinian Arabs will not recognize Israel uh, as a Jewish state. Sovereignty has nothing to do with peace. It is the Palestinian Authority's interest in destroying Israel and not accepting it as a Jewish state. <laughs> and, and many of the people, I will say, who are against it, the public naysayers, people like Dennis Ross and Robert Satloff and Aaron David Miller and Martin Indyk, these people supported Oslo and the Gaza withdrawal, saying this will bring peace. They were dead wrong every time. To listen to these naysayers, 
who are wrong about Oslo and the Gaza withdrawal and the Palestinian Arabs is like going to a lawyer who's never won a case. So uh, it is critically important that we all support this, that this, this be done now. We had the same condemnations when Israel declared uh, Jerusalem a united capital and moved the embassy. The whole world said there'll be riots, it'll be a nightmare, peace will be impossible, <laughs> but none of that happened. The same here, in fact, already, the Palestinian Authority, when they see sovereignty may be happening, have already said, okay, we'll sit down and negotiate. Do you know that, that Abbas, or the Palestinian Authority, has refused to sit down to the table and negotiate for 10 years? He won't even come to the table. And you're saying sovereignty stops peace? It's the Palestinian Arabs who stop peace. Sovereignty has nothing to do with it. But already now he's saying, all right, I'll sit down and negotiate, because he's worried he's going to lose more land uh, 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 if he doesn't try and do something. Although it's a fake, he's not interested in a real peace, but already he's making a moves in that direction. So that's why the Zionist Organization of America and, and the many others uh, support sovereignty now. And those who want to learn more about this, uh, they can go to my website, zoa.org, zoa.org. And much of what I said is on that website. And so people can see it for themselves. All right, Sharon, um, I'd like to respond now. I, I see some hands and some questions. Let me just explain the procedure. Uh, Mort and I will go back and forth maybe a couple of times. And then after we've uh, spoken our piece, we're gonna open it up to questions, not just questions, not just questions, but comments. Uh, we, Mort is exceptionally knowledgeable about this issue. I know a little bit about it also, but we do not have all the information and we wanna hear from you. So we're not gonna say, just ask a question. We want you to share your knowledge and your opinions. That's what this is all about. Uh, so let me just respond to what Moore has said, and then um, if he wants to, he can then respond to what I said, and then we'll open up for questions. So I, I was really <laughs> impressed with, with the breadth of knowledge and the arguments that Moore raised over, over this issue. I, I think historically, your arguments are extremely compelling. And, and the word Philistine, it comes from the Greek. It, they were Greek-speaking peoples who had come into to the area, and into Canaan, into Judea and Samaria. They were outsiders, they were interlopers, and, and they are not native to that area. And so for the Palestinians to call themselves Palestinians indicates they're adopting a name that is not indigenous. By the way, Jews did also in the uh, like early 1900s, late 1800s, Jews and Arabs both referred to themselves as Palestinians before all the uh, conflict and dispute developed. So Jews use that term also. There's Jewish people who call themselves Palestinians, but Jews have now abandoned that term, obviously, because we've adopted a term that describes who we are, which is Israel. I agree with so much of what you said, Mort. All the way throughout history, that claim is good. All the way up to the point where you said, and this is the promised land, and God promised it to the Jewish people, and you as a rabbi, especially should know that God promised the land to the Jewish people. Okay, once you go there, I don't think that argument is helpful. And I think it's extremely dangerous. And therefore I would, as a rabbi, reject it. And, and let me explain why. First of all, if I were to accept that God promised the land of Israel to the Jews in the Torah, and therefore, we can rely on that promise. I would also have to accept that when we read the passage this Friday night about the red heifer, and it's being read, uh, actually it'll be read tomorrow night and Saturday. The red heifer says that you slaughter a red heifer in order to try to atone for sins. And then the high priest, the priest dips his finger into the cow after it's been slaughtered and sprinkles the blood around and then does grisly things with the body parts. And that's the way that we should remove sin. And he says, that's called a hukat olam. That's an eternal covenant. That means that I would have to, as a rabbi, continue to do this eternal covenant, but I don't. Nor does any rabbi. If they did, they'd be shut down by the health department. Why? Because today, modern Jews understand that everything in the Torah isn't necessarily true when it says that God was very nervous about the Tower of Babel because people were building a tower so high they were gonna find out where he's hanging out. 
and they were going to discover his whereabouts. And so the reason why people speak different languages is because God was nervous and created all the different languages in the world in order to confound them so they couldn't build this tower so high. <coughs> I, the rabbi, recognized that this is a very primitive understanding of where languages come from, and it's wrong. And it's not true. So I don't base everything on the Torah as God's word. I represent a branch of Judaism and a type of Judaism reflected by the vast majority of Jews. Reform, Reconstructionist, Humanistic, Jewish Renewal, and the vast majority of Jews who just check out and don't even go to synagogues because they don't believe God wrote the Torah. It's an irrational belief. It's irrational to think that God wrote a Torah which says that you should stone a woman if she's not a virgin when she gets married. It's irrational to think that God would order genocide against all types of people, Amalekites, people of Jericho, Midianites, all types of people because they worship the wrong God. This is irrational. This is dangerous. And modern rabbis reject and repudiate it. And, and it, there's a good reason for it. Because if Jews were to adopt the Torah as our biblical code, we'd be practicing something even more hideous than Sharia law. We'd be stoning people if they violated the Sabbath. We don't do that. And Rabbi. we don't want to base arguments on that. Otherwise, it's very dangerous. The other reason why we don't do that is because if we say that Israel belongs to the Jews because God says so and he promised it to us, if we say that, then how do we argue against the Muslims who say, oh no, your book isn't correct. Our book is right. God promised Israel to us in the Quran. Now, by the way, the Quran doesn't actually say that. In the Quran, there's actually passages that indicate that Judaism is the religion of Israel and that Israel belongs to the Jews, but that's not how they interpret it. And they're not going to, and necessarily going to accept our interpretation. They're going to say, oh, no, no, no. The, the, the Middle East, all of it, everything, Canaan, all of it, Palestine, all of it, it's ours. And we'll fight to the death if you say otherwise. And the Christians are going to say, oh, no, 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 you, you guys both got it wrong. You got it wrong. Look at our Bible. God told us what's going to happen. We know. We have absolute knowledge. We don't need facts. We don't need evidence. We know because God promised to us that in the end of days, you guys are going to kill each other off. You're going to fight Armageddon and you're going to kill each other. And then Bravo. Jesus is going to come in and save everything. So we do not base arguments. We should not base arguments on saying that God said something. Otherwise, we'll just be fighting forever over what God said. Now, Bravo. let me also, more, you'll get your chance in a minute. Let me also let me also respond to your claim that we have to do it now. We have to do it now because we got a friendly president. President Trump's in office now. He's going to accept it. And, and if we wait until Biden, it's never going to happen. I, I, I completely reject that argument also. Your historical arguments, I'm good with. I, I think they're great. The, the, the argument you just raised is a partisan argument. I, I haven't interacted with Biden's staff as you did, but I have seen Biden's statements and they're very, very, very pro-Israel, okay? So President Biden is someone who's a supporter of Israel. Now I will grant to you, he's not gonna support Israel as strongly as President Trump in some ways. In other words, if Israel says they want to do something, President Trump will just go along with it. I agree with that and I also, I also agree with President Trump when he recognized Jewish rights in the Golan. I also agree with President Trump when he wanted to when he transfer the uh, embassy over Jerusalem. I thought those were good things. I thought it was horrible that when he did it, he had two ministers speaking who were Christian who said that Jews are gonna go to hell. I thought that was a horrible thing to do on that auspicious occasion, but I do agree with the transfer. But I don't agree that we should let President Trump do it for this reason. He's completely disgraced and discredited himself as a world leader. He's a laughing stock in the rest of the world. He's curried favor with our enemies and, and a base and, and, and treated in abysmal fashion our friends. And he's disgraced himself as a, as a pathological liar and also someone who can't be trusted, who actually is a friend of Putin and Russia. So if you have him endorsing this, it's going to put a permanent stain on the whole issue to suggest that, well, President Trump likes it, therefore, it must be a good thing. If President Trump likes it, the guy who's opening supporting racism, if he likes it, it'll ruin the entire movement. It'll, it'll cast a permanent stain on it. If you want the movement to be accepted, it's got to be accepted by someone who is a respectable leader, not by President Trump. So, Mort, I'll Rabbi, turn it over to you Rabbi, let, let Mort talk. Rabbi. Yes. <laughs> all right, first of all, 
you based almost every, I, I made 12 major points as to why we support sovereignty. Only one of them was about the promised land, which we Jews believe in. And so do a hundred million evangelical Christians in America and tens of millions of Christians around the world. For those who believe in the Bible, that's one argument to make. It's not the only one. I had 11 other arguments. We don't even need that argument. And yet you only concentrated on that one uh, argument. Which no, I think, it's, I think it's great. You're right. You I'm, don't I'm need the Robin. argument. I'm saying Robin, abandon I'm the argument because you don't responding. need it. Robin. <laughs> That's one of many because I'm appealing, uh, letting people know that hundreds of millions of Christians and Jews uh, believe that. And that's one of 12 arguments. I don't even need that argument. The rest Good. of it suffice. Uh, uh, Jews, by the way, call themselves Palestinians because the whole world called Jews Palestinians. In the movie Exodus, Paul Newman is in that movie as an Israeli Jew, says to his girlfriend, I'm a, 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 a Sabra. And his girlfriend says, what is a Sabra? He said, a native born Palestinian. The whole world knew that Palestine meant Jews. The, uh, uh, <laughs> so of course, that's why we respond to it that way. <laughs> and look, I don't want to get into a political argument. This is not about politics, but I know Joe Biden personally for 25 years and people can vote for whoever they vote for. I'm not endorsing or attacking, but he has condemned Jews living in Judea and Samaria. He's condemned Jews living in Eastern Jerusalem and said, do not build in Eastern Jerusalem, Joe Biden said. He promised me personally that when a very anti-Israel candidate was going to become Under Secretary of State, his name is Stroh Talbot. He promised me when I told him all the negatives about Stroh Talbot, he will vote against him and don't worry, he's no good more. It came to the hearings, he asked all the questions I suggested, the vote came, he voted for him. <laughs> the Iran deal, which gave Iran over $100 billion and a pathway to nukes, he now says, I want to reinstate the Iran deal. It is so dangerous to Israel and America and the world. <laughs> and, and don't ever call Trump a racist. I don't like his personality. I don't like many of the things he says personally. I don't like his name calling. He has many flaws. Uh, Biden has even more flaws. Biden is corrupt. <laughs> he, his son and his brothers became multimillionaires from his corruption with Ukraine and other countries. <laughs> and, uh, and we all know he has serious mental deficits, for God's sakes. Uh, anyone who sees him knows that. He, he says things that make no sense or something is wrong. But Trump is not a racist. His, his daughter is an Orthodox Jew. His son-in-law is an Orthodox Jew. His grandchildren are Orthodox Jews. He loves Israel. And he never said racist things. When he talked about there are good people on both sides in Charlottesville, he meant that there are good people who are in favor of destroying the Robert E. Lee statue and good people who are in favor of keeping it. That is what he meant. This has been a terrible distortion. And Biden repeats this lie all the time. <laughs> but th this is not about politics. This is about why Israel should be applying sovereignty. And I gave you 12 reasons, one of which you refuted. I, for, I believe in the Torah, I believe in the Bible. For those who don't, they should ignore that. But uh, uh, we have many, many other reasons. And it's not partisan to say Biden. Biden has said he is against sovereignty. So if he becomes president, Israel will be much more reluctant, much more frightened to apply sovereignty when the president of the United States will be against it. Biden is not a friend of Israel. I'm sorry to tell you that. I know him. I've even had him speak at one of my dinners because my honoree wanted him. Uh, and, and when I was writing an article about his speech 15 years ago, I couldn't find a single pro-Israel statement he made in the speech. That's a painful fact. Uh, there are many great Democrats for Israel, Brad Sherman, Elliot Engel, who unfortunately lost, uh, and many others, but Biden is not one of them. But this is not about uh, Biden. This is about uh, sovereignty. And Sharon, I want to respond, then we'll open it up to questions. One, I, I think more that you're you're treading on dangerous ground <laughs> because the ZOA, from as you say, from the time my dad was involved, my dad was an extremely pro-Zionist rabbi who was extremely liberal and who didn't believe that God wrote the Torah. For you to say that some of us believe in the Torah as if to suggest that my father didn't, or to suggest that all the reform rabbis in the world or reconstructionist rabbis don't believe in the Torah, that, that is really a very harmful, divisive thing to say. I didn't say it. Yes, I you did. You, you, yes, you said, for those of us who believe in the Torah, 
and uh, uh, implying that I don't, or that my father didn't, or that reformed Jews don't. I never a, implied that, Rabbi. Well, okay, well, good. I'm glad I never you didn't. I'm, gl I'm glad. I'm glad you didn't. All Jews don't. And that's I'm, all I I'm said. Glad. I never implied anything about you okay. or anyone else. Good. Okay, I'm glad you didn't. Because what I, I heard was, for those of us <laughs> who believe in the Torah, I believe in the Torah. I believe in the Torah so strongly that I don't think that we should treat the Torah like a fossil and like a petrified forest. It's a tree. And we believe that it represents our first step towards knowledge and morality and Judaism, not our final step. And so I believe Amen. strongly Amen. in the Torah. And I don't accept anyone even implying that I do not. I believe in this Torah with all my being. And that's why I think that we should treat it with respect and our ancestors with respect, not being enslaved by the past, but being inspired by it. Secondly, I think you're on very, very, very dangerous ground when as the president of the ZOA, you only, only, only have bad things to say about Biden and only, only, only have good things to say about Trump. I that don't want to get into- No, uh, I can't yes. let you get away with that. I have criticized Trump many, many times. I condemned them for his Holocaust messages and other. Don't say things that aren't true, Rabbi, please. I'm basing it please. more on what you said today. <laughs> and what you said today, I listened very carefully. What you said today, I heard a bunch of good things about Trump and a bunch of bad things about Biden. That's about all I heard Israel. today. So, okay, yeah, so that's, all, that's all I heard today. So if you're gonna tell me that no, no Trump I is condemn, not a saint. Let me, let I me finish, Trump please. for his name calling for many of his statements. I condemn very him right good. here. Please, Rabbi. Very let's, good. Let's uh, drop it and be friendly. I'm very <laughs> friendly. I'm very friendly. And I'm just basing on what I heard today. Today, I heard only good about Trump and only bad about Biden. That's not a good position for ZOA to take. Let me just say it also, as far as, and I didn't want to get political, but you brought it up. You're the one who started out talking about, well, we have to do it now under Trump. So let me just say, Trump abandoned the Kurds who are a great ally of Israel. And I don't necessarily think we should place our trust in someone who would do something let's like that. Let's stick to despicable. sovereignty. Let's stick that to was, sovereignty. Don't make this Trump Let's get back on topic, to exactly. Let's get Please. back Mort. on topic. We have a lot of questions in the chat room. If Mort and Rabbi could start reading some of them and answering some of the questions so we can have a dialogue with our guests. Okay, Thank sounds you. like a good idea. Okay. Uh, well, why don't we take questions from people who are raising their hands, and um, and then we'll go to the questions on the uh, group chat. I, okay, let's let's take questions from people who are, have their hands raised. I see um, Marv Schlanger has a question or a comment. Can you open his up, uh, Sharon? Sharon. Can you un can you unmute Marv Schlanger, please? Apparently we're having difficulty doing that. So I'll I'll have Sharon try to get back to you so she can unmute Marv and all the other people. I'll I'll read a let's see. I, I will read one of the uh chat messages. It says um Rabbi Silver or Rabbi Barry started the session asking that everyone should have an open mind. He himself is obstinate and not at all persuasive with his obstinacy. Uh, so let me respond to that. Um, yes, I do feel strongly about certain things. My mind is open. In fact, when Mort started out speaking about the historical basis for Israel having exercise over Judea and Samaria, over 30% of it, I was very influenced by it. I was very persuaded. I think he's extremely persuasive. And I mentioned that. I mentioned the fact that I think historically Israel is a good claim. And I think that Mort made some really great arguments and I agree with him. He said, we should stick to those arguments and not get into the God thing. So I, I agree with that. As far as being obstinate, the fact that I have a, a, a political a position, that I believe something, and the fact that I'm not gonna change my position instantly, automatically, because somebody presents a different point of view, doesn't make me obstinate. It doesn't mean that because I, Having an open mind doesn't mean as soon as somebody says something that you disagree with, you all of a sudden convert and believe what they believe. It means you're open to facts. I believe very strongly my position about God not writing the Torah and it not being infallible. I, I base that on the very essence of my being and my father, what he taught me. 
the fact that I'm not going <laughs> to abandon that belief instantly because somebody presents a different point of view doesn't make me obstinate. It makes me human. It means that I have beliefs. I will allow facts to influence my decisions, but they, I might hear facts and still have the same opinion afterwards. So the fact that I don't change everything I believe instantly doesn't mean that I'm obstinate. Uh, let's see what else. We, um, Sharon, are you able to open up the, the 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 microphone for other people? Are you able to do that yet? Yes, yes. Go I'm ahead. trying. Then I'll let you orchestrate that. You decide who speaks because I, I don't want to do it, and then you have to do it. You go ahead. Take. Let's take hands. Go ahead. Okay. So somebody on the Apple iPod, iPad, please go. Hello. Um, this is Julia from California. I wanted the rabbi to um, consider the two following facts. Uh, only two years residence in pre-state Palestine is required for status as a Palestinian. Hmm. Also, there is an interview in uh, T-E-R-O-U-W, True Newspaper, that's a Dutch newspaper, 1977, with a PLO leader named Mosin. He reports that, frankly, Palestinians are simply a propaganda construct to be used to attack and to destroy Zionism. Judea is the home of the indigenous Jews. Biden does not consider any of this in his approach. His approach is purely political and it panders to whatever power groups he thinks he needs in order to uh, be in charge. And actually it's not Biden being in charge, it's whoever's handling him. Biden uh, is long beyond the point where he can think for himself. So I would appreciate both Mort and the rabbi making uh, some brief comments to my to what I have said. And thank you. <laughs> and go ahead, Mort. You go first, and I'll go. Well, <laughs> there's been many statements for decades from senior PLO officials uh, uh, making it clear that the Palestinians use the name Palestinian. Uh, simply as a way to try and uh, harm Israel and destroy Israel uh, and kill Jews, frankly. So that's, and by the way, the PLO was formed in 1964, the Palestine Liberation Organization. That was when the Palestinian Arabs, when Jordan controlled all of Judea and Samaria, the Sinai, Eastern Jerusalem. So what were they liberating then? It was formed to dis liberate uh, Israel proper, even within the 67 lines. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Look, Joe Biden is not anti-Israel, that he wants Israel destroyed. Absolutely not. He simply has a view on Israel that's a view of a left-wing person who thinks Israel should go back to the 67 line and create a Palestinian state, which unfortunately would be an Iran-Hamas terrorist state. Gaza was given away unilaterally, completely and wholly. All the Jews thrown out, all the soldiers removed and we've gotten 25,000 rockets. It doesn't appease because the goal is not a Palestinian state, it's Israel's destruction. And that's why nothing has worked for 27 years since Oslo, for 72 years since Israel's been created. Remember the Palestinian Arabs could have had a state in 1948, but six Arab nations invaded to destroy the fledgling state of Israel. They were offered a state, this is very important. The Palestinian Arabs were offered a state in 1937, in 1948, in, uh, in 2000, 2001, 2008, they were offered a state, even 2014, they rejected it every time. When Ehud, Omer, and Barak offered them a state, the Arabs said no, with no counteroffer. Uh, uh, so it is quite clear, statehood is not the issue, it's Israel's destruction. That's why nothing has worked since Oslo uh, Accords were agreed to. Thank you very much, Mort. I'm gonna recommend to Sharon and to all the questioners and to me and Mort, we can find our question or comment and our response to one minute. So I'm gonna do this now in one minute. Um, I agree with what the caller is saying and what Mort is saying about the Palestinians. I think they've shown themselves to be violent, vile terrorists. They originally aligned with, uh, with Hitler. They, they have no right to anything. They have no right to a country. They have no right to anything as politically because they're, they, they're, they're run. They actually elected Hamas to represent them. So you can't deal with terrorists, and I agree with that. And I agree with what Moore said and what the caller said. I, I also agree that Palestinians, is, it's a propaganda tool. There is no Palestinian people. And I, I think the whole thing is just ridiculous. As far as um, Biden is concerned, 
my my dad is from the same town as Biden. They're both from Wilmington, Delaware. They knew each other. My dad was very convinced of Biden's credentials as a Zionist and uh, as a pro-Zionist, and that's why he was very friendly with them. And they exchanged many, many correspondences and phone calls saying how much Biden was committed to Israel. So I don't agree with labeling him as somehow anti-Israel. He might not agree with the settlers. I find what the settlers are doing very unsettling too. And, but I, I don't think that it's fair to say that he's anti-Israel. I think he's pro-Israel. He might not be as much pro-Israel or, or as strongly pro-Israel as other people, but I think he's a very, very good guy and I think he's very pro-Israel. All right, next. Okay. Go ahead, um, owner, somebody with the letter uh, yes, O. Uh, Mark from Jupiter. And um, I'd just like to say, first of all, um, thank you for allowing me to participate in this. And I just want to make it quick in a sense. Israel uh, is surrounded by many enemies. And for the first time in history, they have a chance for a real peace for Israel and the Palestinians. The President of the United States, President Trump, has made a plan that's, that's actually workable for both sides. You know, everybody should be endorsing it, and I don't understand. I mean, I guess this, this dera Trump derangement syndrome, people just, just hate the President regardless of what he does, and he's helping everybody because the Palestinians get a state and Israel gets a state. It's a win-win for everybody. So. <laughs> More, you want to respond? Yes. Uh I would say that as long as the Palestinian Authority pays Arabs to murder Jews for God's sakes, they spend 400 million a year giving pensions to any Arab who's murdered a Jew, whether he goes to prison or is killed. If he's killed, they give it to his family. And the more Jews an Arab has murdered, the higher their pension. And the pension is five times the average salary of a Palestinian Arab. So it's a very good way to make money is killing Jews. As long as they do that, as long as they will not accept Israel as a Jewish state, as long as they won't arrest terrorists and keep them in prison, it is clear that this will be a Hamas, Iran, Fatah terrorist state. So I completely oppose a Palestinian state now because it'll be a terrorist state. If this would be a civilized country like Canada, uh, we would have a different discussion. Uh, but right now, anyone who talks about having a Palestinian state is talking about having another terrorist state in the Middle East, which would wreak havoc in the Middle East. It would be a very dangerous thing. So. Uh, I, we strongly oppose it because uh, statehood is not, a, a terrorist state is not something we want. I want to I want to agree with uh, Maura Klein. The Palestinians have shown themselves incapable of having a state. You don't support terrorism. Like I just talked about Ali Raisman <laughs> speaking out for the Israeli athletes <laughs> who were slaughtered in 72. You don't invade the Olympic Games and slaughter athletes and then say, give us a state. This is outrageous. They, ha they have no business having a state and it would be a terrorist state. It would be a, a horrible thing. And I agree with the, uh, the caller um, about Israel is surrounded by enemies and therefore everything it does, we have to understand that we finally have a Jewish state after 2000 years. We have to protect it and keep it strong and understand that Israel must take measures in order to make sure that this Jewish state survives. I'm not gonna get political, but if someone says that I have Trump derangement syndrome and they bring it up, I will respond. He said that we don't like Trump regardless of what he does. That is a complete lie. We don't like Trump because of what he does. I have no issue with Trump, but when he does all these horrible things, including being a climate denier, which Israel has said, climate change is the greatest threat to Israel even more than the Arabs. We're getting off to the elect, Let me finish, Mort. Getting off the subject. Let me finish, Mort. To have a president who says that the greatest threat to Israel is a hoax, who also said that the coronavirus is a hoax, and who, who this is dangerous stuff. Climate change will destroy Israel. It will allow Israel to be buried under the sea, and we must fight against anyone who calls climate change a hoax. They are a great danger to Israel and to the world. <laughs> Look, uh, I've spoken no, it's to all, no, you're done. We, now we go to the next caller. Each one of us gets one minute. Go ahead. Next call, Next person. Okay. Kevin Ross. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, uh, how do you, as a rabbi, reconcile the most recent, uh, the, just a parsha or two ago, shlach, 
where the Jews were commanded to go into the land and conquer the land and take the land. And because they didn't have enough faith to do it, they were punished. And now on Tisha B'Av, we mourn for that mistake that we made for all time. And that's when they had to fight giants and actually conquer the land. Now, we already are, are sovereign within Israel proper. And all we have to do is make a legal motion to extend sovereignty. And, and it seems that here we are again, making the same mistake that these Miraglim, the spies made. And so I just want to understand like how, a, you know, it's one thing for a Jewish person to do, it's another, it's a, you're a rabbi. Like how do you reconcile being diametrically on the opposite side of what the Torah traditional teaching is teaching us? Well, let me respond to that. Well, well, the Orthodox rabbis are diametrically opposed also. They don't stone virgins, uh, people who aren't virgins if they get married. They don't recommend that's, stoning that's, a disrespectful that's not how the son. Is let, me finish, let me finish my answer, please. Can I, can I finish my answer? Well, I'm happy the to. Way, the way that I reconcile it is to suggest that fortunately, fortunately, there are no Jews who treat the Torah as God's word. They say they do, but they don't. Because if we did, we would have to be stoning disrespectful children, women who are not virgins on marriage, and also people who disagree with us, like the entire nation, the entire Midianite people, the entire city of Jericho, God ordered to be exterminated. As a rabbi who believes in peace and justice and love, I repudiate that and chalk it up to a primitive aspect of our history that we've since outgrown. Now, the, the scouts looked at the land and they said, there's people in the land that are very strong and they're powerful. And the, and the message was, we can beat them. So what, what that means is that there's people who are living in the land and God's ordering them to go in and exterminate them. There, this, this wasn't vacant land. They were living there and, the, and they were ordered to go in and exterminate them. That is something that I reject and repudiate. And I hope, I hope that everyone on this line repudiates genocide because we Jews know what genocide is. And the for land any was Jewish to person taken. to say, for Thank any you. Jewish person, for any Jewish person to say that they approve of genocide because it's written in the Torah, shame on you. They were taking rabbi, back the land, Rabbi. Next. It used to belong to shame, and it seems you missed that. Thank you, <laughs> Rabbi. I beseech you. This is not a discussion about Biden or Trump. It's not a discussion about the veracity of the Torah. It's about sovereignty and or and Black Lives Matter. We should stick to that topic and not get off topic. <laughs> uh, I simply wanted to add from what I said before, the Palestinian Authority also, people should know, they named schools and streets and sports teams and children's camps after Jew killing terrorists. They have parades honoring terrorists when they die, giving them great honor. Uh, so this is a really vicious terrorist regime. The thought of giving sovereignty and more power and strength to such a, a regime is frightening to me as a Jew, it's frightening to, any Israel, to most Israelis, and it should be frightening to the whole world. It will destabilize the world having another terrorist state there. Sharon, take another caller, please. Okay. Susan Cohn, SK, if you could please uh, speak. Thank you. Um, I, Rabbi, I agree with you that we should all, given our history, be concerned about the genocide, genocide and, and the, the existential threats to the Jewish state and the Jewish people. And I think if you asked anybody in the know, they would argue that that threat right now is coming from Iran, which vows repeatedly to wipe Israel off the map, which recently promised another final solution. Um, and I think it's, it's for anybody, particularly a presidential candidate, to be in favor of a, of a deal which gave Iran $150 billion to move toward that objective, uh, which, um, which basically paved a path for them to acquire nuclear weapons. And, f and then after that deal, to see what Iran continues to do, uh, to continue to maintain that position that um, you, should, you should trust Iran um, and try to bring Iran back into the quote unquote brotherhood of nations, um, that is the, I think we're losing sight of the forest for the trees here a little bit. Um, and Iran, Iran I, and this does have to do with sovereignty because Iran is backing Hamas. Um, and and Iran, it's Iran's propaganda that's causing a lot, much of the hatred and the anti-Semitism that we're all feeling today. And I think that's, um, that's the primary concern of the Jewish people right now. 
And just one more point. I, I, it really, it really um, amazes me how a rabbi, a rabbi, uh, cannot acknowledge the fundamental and unbreakable connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. At least half of the 613 commandments of the Bible are only applicable to the land of Israel. The, the land of Israel, God giving us the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible 2,319 times. That's certainly not analogous to the law of the heifer. I mean, the, the importance of it to us, to who we are, to our faith, to our very identity as Jews. And that's in my, in my thoughts. Okay, I, I appreciate Susan's call. And you've totally misrepresented what I said. I, I said from the very beginning that the Jews have a historical connection. I, I believe in that and I agree with that. And that's why I support Israel so strongly. Why, I, why you're saying that I don't agree with that is totally beyond me other than other than some people are just being highly partisan and attacking me because they think maybe I'm from some different political party or a different branch of Judaism. Let me repeat again. I agree that the Jews have a historical connection to Israel and that is unbreakable. And that is why I support Israel. And what I'm saying is let's stick to that argument and not go with the argument about God promising Israel to the Jews because that is a lousy, horrible argument. Because when you tell me that I don't believe in the Torah, which I've now heard quite a few times, I will respond. This is a, 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 a slander. It's irrational. It's divisive. I don't question your, your Judaism because you have a different branch of Judaism. But to suggest that because I oppose the genocide that's advocated in the Torah and is practiced in the Torah, where Moses and Joshua repeatedly commit genocide, because as I, a Jew, find that morally offensive okay. and do Where not I? believe that God wrote it, because of that, for you to say, well, you're a rabbi, how do you dare, oh, you're a rabbi, to, to imply that a rabbi should not be just, and that if you question anything in the Torah, that means you're not a rabbi or a religious leader. Let me just explain. I've heard this over a thousand times. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. It's divisive. Okay, and can it's you wrong? Let's Susan. Okay. Let's uh, Susan uh, call. Next, next uh, person. I, I, I still think. Well, rabbi, what do you? What is your response to um, Iran? The, I, 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 and, and let me ask, let me let me let me ask you this as well. You. You basically slandered the President of the United States and kept calling him a liar. And, and this isn't, if you look at the background of the Iran deal, there's an article, the article is published and they're called What They Said and What We Know Now by Svi Khan. And what they demonstrate is that the Obama administration lied repeatedly, repeatedly, hundreds of times about every single thing they told us about the Iran deal. And they basically, they basically fooled and tried to, tried to fool the, the, the American people in Congress into the truth. Um, and so and, and I don't think it can be denied that Iran is the issue right now that, that confronts us Jews. Right. Very right, let, let me respond. Right. First, first of all, Iran has nothing to do with the conversation, but you, yes, you put does. me in a box. Well, you put me in a box. Susan, because... Susan, listen, listen, listen. You put me in a box and you're wrong. You assume that because I've said certain statements, that means I supported the Iran deal. You're wrong. I oppose the Iran deal vigorously. I debated Congressman Deutsch. I spoke out ardently against the deal with Iran. I thought it was a horrible thing. You don't reward groups that support terrorists. I, I advocated invading Iran and overturning their government when the people were revolting against them. So don't put me in a box. No, no, don't assume that you... I believe things that I don't believe. Mm -hmm. Let me also you... respond. Mm -hmm. It is not slander. Right. Rabbi, not, I think it's... we should no, I no, I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond guys. to what's, if, if somebody challenges my views, I'll respond. It is not slander to say that President Trump is a liar. Slander means to make false statements about someone. Robert, if you say he tells the truth, that's, a, that's slander. That's a false statement. If I say he's a liar, that's not slander. That's true. Next I think we should. I think we should go into Black Lives Matter. It's okay. up to you, but... It's I, up to I agree you, with you. Well, no, there's a couple, there's some more people who definitely want to weigh in. I know I saw... Andy Sussman, who's our, our cantorial soloist, and I see Norman Cohen. I, I'd definitely like raised, to get them Rabbi. in on this issue. And then they the don't have their hands one. raised. So the only other person with their hand raised is MS, if you could speak, Mike S. Norman Cohen also. His hand is not yes, raised. Thank you. Yes, it is. The question I have Mike, for go Rabbi ahead. Uh, more Klein, actually, is if everything that you're saying is true um, about the our right to the land of Judea and Samaria, why should we limit 
what we're trying to create sovereignty over to just a portion of it versus all of it right now? That's a good question. You have to ask Mort to answer that one because he's the one who's no, no, recommending I, the 30%. Well, well first of all, <coughs> the plan on the table that uh, Donald Trump uh, and his team put together is for the 30%. That's what's on the table. Uh, nothing else is on the table now. In addition, of course, there is an issue that in much of the, the rest of the Palestinian Authority, Israel's given away 40% of it already. That's, that, and Israel's given away Gaza. That's where 99% of the Palestinian Arabs live. So they live under their own rule. They have their own parliament, their own TV, their own police, their own textbooks, their own schools. They run their own lives except security. <laughs> so we're only talking about what's on the table now. Uh, ultimately, you know, uh, uh, we cannot foresee what will happen with the rest of the Palestinian Authority. But right now, when you have a million and a half Arabs there, this is not a time to discuss sovereignty there, because then you'll have to give the vote to the people who live there, and uh, Israel will be diminished as a Jewish state. So uh, what's on the table is the 30% in Samaria. And, and that's, that, that's all we should be discussing. That's what's on the table. Nothing else is possible right now. Uh, next you just, you're kicking the can down the road. Next, next question. Uh, Andy Sussman and Norman okay, hold Cohen on. have their hands up. Hold on, yeah. Rabbi. If anybody wants to speak, please raise your hand. Not, virtu not virtually raise your hand, but please raise your Zoom hand on the lower right side of the screen. Click on participants and raise your hand because so quickly, the way we have I can Andy, see it. Andy Sussman, Norm Cohen, and Mars Slanger all want to speak. Go ahead. It doesn't work that way. <coughs> they have to raise their virtual hand. I'm sorry. They, they are. have to raise their virtual they hand. I can't, I can't do it and record at the same time. Norman Cohen. Andy Sussman and Marv Schlanger all have raised their hands and they all want to speak. Okay, Norm, Norman, Cohen. Norman. Go yeah. ahead, Norman. I have a question. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes. This is for Herb. I'm a little confused about resolution, UN resolution 2334. How does that relate to the issues? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, resolution 2334, which uh, is what the very hostile to Israel President Barack Obama behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, urged people in the National Security, uh, UN National Security Council to adopt uh, uh, states falsely that all the land past the 67 line is Arab land. That means the Jewish quarter, the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, everything that's so Jewish, it's beyond belief. <laughs> he stated that. And uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, that's there. There's many other. Unmute. Unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't see the answer. In fact, there's a movement. There's a there's a movement in the Senate to uh, cut aid to the UN until they uh, rescind this absurd resolution uh, promoting falsehoods. Uh, in fact, when I talked to many Democrats, Chuck Schumer on down back in those days when Obama was president, and I was worried that he would have such a resolution before he leaves the office, they swore to me, he will never do this more, don't worry. He knows we would go crazy in Congress if we did this, and yet he did this. Uh, there's many uh, uh, you know, resolutions that are, that, that are ignored, and, and, this, and when something is this absurd, uh, it, it, it really doesn't have any important impact. Just, just very briefly, uh to, to hear the head of the ZOA not be able to say the word Obama without the very hostile to Israel Obama, I think is very harmful to the ZOA. And I also believe that Obama helped with the uh, support of the Iron Dome. He did certain things that the ZOA doesn't like. He did certain things they do. But to refer to him 
without saying his name, but they're very hostile to Israel and to praise other Republicans. I think it's making the ZOA appear very I, partisan. I don't think that's I, a good idea. I praised Brad Sherman. I praised Elliot Engel. They're Democrats who are very good on Israel. And by the way, President Obama cut in half every year the amount of money going for the Iron Dome. It was Congress that reinstated that money. He tried to cut in half the money. I know this. I'm on the Hill all the time. <laughs> and uh, I say he was very hostile to Israel uh, beca because he was. I mean, to have to promote a resolution and refuse to veto it, saying all the land past the 67 line is Arab land. How much more hostile can you get than that? OK, our next question is Andy Sussman. Andy? Like to, quick, a quick question. There's a documentary, a British documentary called Gatekeepers, and it, it explored the Shin Bet and it interviewed six of the previous Shin Bet leaders. Uh, two of those leaders openly admitted that Israel's policies from the 1960s and 70s on was to destabilize any nascent <laughs> governance in the West Bank. So basically, they were saying that from get-go, from the occupation forward of the West Bank, we have sabotaged the ability of the Palestinians to even attempt <laughs> self-governance. <laughs> and so what we've done is we can't have it both ways. Either we're about democracy and respect and honor the other, or we want our cake and eat it too. I totally agree we have to have secure borders, but I don't validate the incursion into occupying and, and taking land where people live. If you're gonna use that argument, what you're doing basically is adopting manifest destiny, which genocide and removal of the Native Americans from their land. So, Either you want to look at history or you want to be cherry pick and selective. I'll let the rabbi and Mort respond to that. Well, I'll say, if I, I'm permitted to speak first, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, <laughs> Israel's, uh, Israel has given away all of Gaza and 40% of Judea and Samaria. That's where 99% of the Palestinian Arabs live. They run their own lives completely except security. And they would run security if there weren't terrorist cells constantly evolving to come into Israel and murder Jews. That's the reason we have IDF soldiers there uh, rooting out terror cells, arresting terrorists repeatedly, almost on a weekly basis because of the terrorism. <laughs> Israel, Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmer offered a state three times to the Palestinian Authority, uh, to Abbas and to Arafat. They offered a state on 90 to 97% of Judea and Samaria, half of Jerusalem, billions of dollars in aid. And I asked Olmer myself, how could he not take this extraordinary deal you offered? Uh, and he said, uh, Abbas said to him, he can't offer it, he can't accept it unless you allow the so-called, the claim of return, where millions of Arabs will be able to come into Israel and destroy the Jewish state. And he says, I can't accept it. If you require that I accept Israel as a Jewish state, I won't. So they could have had their own state from 1937 to 2008, they turned it down, uh, every single time. And by the way, Avi Dichter, the past head of the Shin Bet, Shin Bet himself, said we need to have sovereignty now for security and uh, historical reasons as well. Uh, so they could have had their state. Uh, they have no interest in the state if it means accepting Israel as a Jewish state, because they will never do that, unfortunately. I want to thank uh, Andy for that wonderful question. We have to understand that it's not totally black and white, and that there are other arguments to make, and I appreciate Andy for raising it. If, if two people from the Sheen Bet are saying that Israel tried to destabilize the West Bank, we should take that seriously, not just slough it off as if it means absolutely nothing. I also agree that, the, to me, the settlers are very unsettling. We, we know that what Mort said is true, that in the 1800s, there weren't a lot of Palestinians, there weren't, there weren't many people living in the area. But when Israel was established in 48, there were Palestinian communities that have been there for a long time. Those communities no longer exist. Okay, we have to understand that. So I support Israel as strongly as the next guy, but we have to understand that there are Arab communities that no longer exist. To continue that and to have settlers moving into 
Arab areas and trying to take land where, that could have been used for a Palestinian area once they get their act together to, to continue this is like, as Andy says, it's manifest destiny. And the problem is that when you have people who believe that God's on your side and God gave you this land, you'll do anything. You'll commit any atrocity. You'll do anything, no matter how hideous, because God ordered it. You'll even murder someone like Yitzhak Rabin, who was murdered by someone who went to three Orthodox rabbi in a, in a bed dean and said, should I blow away Rabin? He gave away Arab land. They said, absolutely, kill him. And, and Rabin was portrayed in Nazi garb by people who thought that God gave land the land of Israel to the Jews who thought it based on the Torah, and they they allowed this hate speech to go on that ended up in the assassination Time. of Rabin. We do not Time. want to have fanatics governing Israel. Time. Next question. I have uh, Len Getz. I'm going to unmute Len Getz. Go ahead. L I. L I. Len Getz's iPhone, are you there? Okay, the host is not allowed to show me. Okay, you're there, you're on. Can you you're hear on. me? Okay, okay. Um, the, the issue we can of, hear of, you. Stop, we can hear me? Okay, great. Um, so the Israeli government was, wanted to establish uh, sovereignty on July 1st. Um, Michael, Michael Pompeo said it's up to the Israelis to establish sovereignty, it's in their hands. We have new <laughs> Arab countries who say that uh, we don't, it's okay to have sovereignty. We're not going to make any big deal about it. We're not going to uh, harass Israel. Um, even, even and, and, and Habas says, most of the Arabs, you know, really don't, are not really so strongly against sovereignty. So in fact, since we have all this um, um, quietness on the Arab side with regard to sovereignty, and most of the American Jewish people want it, and the American government seems to want it. What is the, what is the, what is the delay? Who more do you know? What is the delay on uh, on on expanding and declaring sovereignty on parts of the Judea and Samaria? Thirty percent. That's going to be going to Israel anyway, no matter what kind of plan or agreement that that, that ever ever evolves. If if there ever was a plan that's that's actually going to evolve, that the Arabs are going to accept. Um, any any thoughts about this? Thank you, Len. Rabbi. Actually, let more to answer, and then I'll go ahead and answer after him. Go ahead. I, I have to tell you, my battery was ready to die. I went in the other room to re, to put the charger in, so I frankly didn't hear the whole question. I have more. Uh, let me. Uh, he asked, "What's the delay in sovereignty?" If the, he says, "If the Jewish people want it, Israel wants it, the president wants it, why are we delaying?" And also, the Arabs are not. Are not I'm not contesting. Well, the Arabs are not objecting to it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first of all, they, I, in my discussions with top officials, they told me they're still working out details as to precisely what parts of the 30% of the land they're proposing should be included. They haven't been finalized yet. The security and strategic issues are, have not been finalized yet. But I was told that the odds are very high this will be this will happen in the next 30 to 45 days uh, so um, and and the officials in the, in the American US government said it's, it's really totally up to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, I also might add you said first of all in terms of this of the communities in Judean Samaria only two percent of the entire West Bank Judean Samaria is where the Jews live. Two percent, not twenty percent, not forty percent. Two percent. They have not taken over areas where Arabs live. Arab, in fact, this was given away forty percent of Judean Samaria, where virtually all the Arabs live. <laughs> and this awful Nazi garb, I have to respond to, Rabbi, <laughs> was put out by a by a a a a, a, a set up phony uh, 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 Israeli. Uh, uh, or uh, a government organization to try and make the right of center people look bad. This was written about a hundred times. This was not done by Jews in Judea and Samaria. This was done by a group, I forget their name now. Uh, the head of it, by the way, left Israel because he should have been indicted for encouraging this man to, to kill uh, Rabin. 
that's a whole other issue. But the, everyone in this call should understand only 2% of Judea and Samaria is where the Jews live. That's it. And they haven't built rabbi. Not a single new Jewish community since Oslo began in 1993. None. The only building that's happened is within the existing boundaries of the existing communities that were there in 93. And that's very important for people to understand. Rabbi? Yeah. Um, there were rallies that were held by right-wing people where, not, where Nazi guard was put on Rabin. If it was a left-wing coup, why didn't they say something and object? They didn't. This, you object it's not, just, people it's calling, not just that. It's not just that, more. people calling Donald Trump a Nazi, it's, an anti-Semite? Do you object to that? I've never it's heard not, you object to that. It, it's, um, not, it's not just that they dressed him in Nazi garb. It's that there was hate speech about him. The assassin went to three Orthodox rabbis who all said that he should blow him away. Not only that, the guy who murdered Arabs in a mosque, Baruch Goldstein, the right wing set up a shrine to him and created his shrine. So this is something that's very dangerous when you use God to say that God allows us to do anything. If the Jews only occupy, or if the Jews are only living in 2% of Judea and Samaria, then more you need to do a better job of explaining why you want 30% of it to be under Israeli sovereignty. Finally, I'll say this, that we- For in, security in favor, reasons. Okay, in, 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 favor, in favor of the suggestion, I think we should remember that Israel needs to do a better job in PR, because the fact that Israel might be sovereign over this land doesn't mean that the people don't have the right to govern their own affairs. Jews live under occupation, you could say, in every country in the world. There are Jewish minorities in all the different countries. They don't demand that they be in charge of their own rule. So there's a good argument to be made that Israel can exercise sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, and so what? So there's Arabs living under Israeli rule. So what? that Jews live under other people's rule all the time. There's no problem with that. Should we get into okay. Black Lives Matter? Yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah, let's do it. We're running out of time, guys. Um, all right. We have two more <laughs> hands raised. Should we go on to Black Lives Matter? I, I think, think we, we should go to Black Lives Matter. Go ahead, Mort. You start. Is that all right? Yeah, yes. you start. All right. <laughs> we at ZOA became very concerned <laughs> that Black Lives Matter, the group, not the discussion that Black Lives do matter, of course Black Lives Matter, of course Jewish lives matter, and all lives matter, even though people politically, it's politically incorrect to even say that now. Of course, but the organization Black Lives Matter, <laughs> the uh, group, I was worried that they were gaining incredible visibility, credibility, and legitimacy and that their viciously anti-Semitic, anti-Israel platform would influence young, more young blacks to hate Jews in Israel. Their platform <laughs> uh, calls Israel an apartheid genocidal state. Imagine, they say Israel's committing genocide against the Arabs. There were 200,000 Arabs in this area in 1948. Today, there are 2 million. So whoever's in charge of the genocide program, it's not working out too well. <laughs> they support BDS. They align themselves with the Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a terrorist group. They publicly claim that Israel stole Palestinian land. They blame Israel, for God's sakes, who trained police in America. They say Israel is training police in America to target blacks. Outrageous lie. <laughs> they say Zionism at its core is white supremacy. They want all aid to Israel ended. Uh, not aid to, uh, ended, uh, aid to Egypt or Jordan. They never talk about that. <laughs> and by the way, many major people have come out calling them anti-Semitic. Alan Dershowitz said they're an anti-Semitic group, Caroline Glick, Jonathan Tobin of JNS, Ruthie Bloom of the, of the Jerusalem Post, Joel Pollack, Doe Fisher, a prominent rabbi and law professor in LA. <laughs> Melanie Phillips said, the atmosphere we have today is reminiscent of the 17th century Salem witch hunts, where people aren't allowed to criticize Black Lives Matter, they're called racist. She says Black Lives Matter is an anti-Israel, anti-white, anti-Jewish uh, hate group. And Dershowitz said that until they renounce this platform, that no one should have anything to do with the organization Black Lives Matter. And not only are they anti-Israel, they want all uh, police departments eliminated. They want the U.S. military eliminated. Uh, and, and they stay publicly. 
There's no distinction between violence and nonviolence. It's all resistance. They really promote violence. <laughs> so this is a very dangerous uh, anti-Semitic group. And in rallies now in America, only yesterday, they're screaming, Israel kills Jew Arab children. In uh, England, they're screaming that Jews won't let any criticism of Zionism. <laughs> so to, and in the streets of LA, as Doe Fisher wrote, they were screaming, led by a Black Lives Matter official, they were screaming, kill the Jews, F Israel, free Palestine, and they put those words on synagogues and Jewish institutions around Los Angeles and destroyed three quarters of the Jewish store in the Jewish area, Pico Robertson. This is a very dangerous group. And let me tell you, as you know, Rabbi, because I've simply called out the organization and the platform of Black Lives Matter, not the issue that Black Lives do, uh, of course matter, not the issue as we condemn ZOA, condemn the killing of, uh, of George Floyd and the other uh, killings which were totally wrong. We called it out. I, I, I fought for black voting rights and civil rights in the 60s. I was in marches in rallies in sit-ins. I went to Mississippi for God's sakes. And yet, because I call out Black Lives Matter, do you know, 16 members of the Conference of Presidents, including the reform movement leaders and the conservative Jewish movement leaders and the Jewish women's groups and uh, the, the Jewish Labor Party groups uh, publicly said, I am promoting hate. The head of the reform movement, Rick Jacobs, publicly said, I am a racist and I should be thrown out of the Conference of Presidents. Why? Because I call out their platform of genocide and apartheid Israel as being anti-Semitic. As Alan Dershowitz went on television said, this is ridiculous. They are anti-Semitic. They should condemn me as well if they're condemning Mort Klein. I will defend, said, Mort, said Dershowitz, Mort Klein politically, and I will defend him legally uh, against this outrageous charge. So this, we Jews should be publicly condemning the platform and the organization Black Lives Matter, not the movement for racial justice, but this platform has to go. They must denounce it because we're having attacks on Jews and, one, and proclamations against Jews, kill the Jews. Verbal violence, as our history tells us, Rabbi, soon becomes a, a physical violence. Verbal violence ends in an effusion of Jewish blood. That worries me very much. All of the rabbis, all of the Jewish leaders must condemn this platform and demand that Black Lives Matter organization renounce this platform and rescind it. Let, let me respond now and say that I congratulate and applaud Mort Klein. I agree with everything he just said. I, I, I strongly object to his being censored and, and to being condemned by liberal groups. I find it uh, morally offensive that that would even come up. I agree 100% with everything that he said. I also, our congregation, Lador Vador, we don't belong to the reform movement. We uh, practice something I refer to as cosmic Judaism, but I, I do not appreciate the reform movement towing the party line of the liberals any more than I agree with a lot of right-wing people towing a party line also. I, I, I do not agree with, with, the, with the liberal movement's condemnation of, of Moore Klein, and I, and I agree 100%. Black Lives Matter is a movement, and it's also a, a, an organization, a loose organization. The organization I agree with more should be condemned they have a platform, as he says, BBS they support. And to refer to what Israel does as genocide, as he says, that they're doing it, they're doing a lousy job of it. To say that is not just anti-Israel, it's anti-Semitic. Yes, yes. To accuse yes. the Jewish people who have been subjected to genocide of committing genocide is not a political view, it's not a religious view, it's not an anti-Israel view, it's blatant anti-Semitism in its crudest form. And to suggest that Black Lives Matter as an organization should be given respect, I do not. They, the, the Black movement now can decide, are they gonna go the way of Farrakhan, who's anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, or Martin Luther King, who loved Israel, who condemned anti-Zionism and said that anti-Zionism is racism and anti-Semitism. We must encourage the Black people to go with Martin Luther King. As Mort said, Jewish people aligned with the with NAACP and with Martin Luther King and Heschel marched hand in hand. We should be thanked for helping the to advance civil rights. And the people that condemn the blacks also condemn the Jews. And Black Lives Matter is betraying, betraying the message of Martin Luther King. It's a Shonda. 
and we have to encourage them to go the right way. It should also be remembered that Israel believes in Black Lives Matter far more than most other countries do. They go into Africa. They're welcomed in Africa. They help Africa. They help Black Lives. They help with irrigation, with technology. Israel brings in the Palashah Jews. Israel believes in Black Lives Matter. And all the liberals who are condemning Israel should support Israel as the bastion of civil rights and democracy and a, and a haven for all the ideals that they cherish. I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of liberals bashing Israel. And for people to say, well, Black Lives Matter, they, repudiate, they, they no longer follow this platform. Let them repudiate the platform. Let them denounce the platform. And then maybe we'll deal with them. Because where Black Lives Matter is Go, you see rioting, you see anti-police action, you see anti-Semitism. How do I know that? I've organized rallies myself for the environment or for Israel or for immigration. And at those rallies, I see, I have seen Black Lives Matter people come in and try to destroy it and undermine it. The organization, I believe, should be condemned. And the movement for black liberation, which I support, which more support, which the Jewish people support, is being derailed and taken over the train tracks if we do this. We must liberate ourselves from, from having the movement led by them. I think this issue is so important that I would like to invite Mort back and have everybody else weigh in on this. I know Sharon told me that her time is limited. She's already gone beyond it. I appreciate it. And I'm just going to say one final thing before I conclude. I have received like Mort has, he's, he's received terrible threats from the left, people saying horrible things about him. So have I, from the right. I support Israel's right to exist. I strongly have gone to, I've, I've been in the middle of rallies that are anti-Israel, I've had my life threatened. I fought hard for Israel, and so has my dad. And we're both very, very pro-Israel and very liberal. I'm seeing comments now along the, the, the group chat that I see when I write for the Jewish Journal, right-wing Jews saying, you're not a rabbi, he's a racist, he's anti-Israel, he's all this stuff. Stop it. Stop making this so partisan. Stop politicizing it. Stop, stop condemning people who disagree with you. I don't condemn right-wing people at all. The president I'll make an exception for. He's one person I think he is reprehensible. But I don't condemn right-wing. And we should not be doing this. We should unite as a Jewish community because Israel is going to be strengthened when all Jews join together. All Jews come together, regardless of partisan, and place Israel above partisan politics. I thank you, Mark, for your dedication, your commitment to Israel. And I'd like to invite you back if you'd like to. And I'd like to invite everyone else to come back as well to discuss Black Lives Matter, because I'm concerned about this group. Yeah, happy to. And by the way, it's important for people to know the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, Pro promotes and provides Black Lives Matter materials in schools around the country. And this week has partnered with one of the big public anti-Semites in America, Al Sharpton, to allegedly fight hate. A man who's called Israel the hell on earth, a man who has incited pogroms, attacks against Jews in Crown Heights, uh, uh, and yet ADL partners and gives legitimacy to a public anti-Semite. There's supposed to be fighting defamation. Instead, they're legitimizing defamation by embracing uh, 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 Al Sharpton. And by the way, by embracing George Soros, one of the great funders of anti-Zionist Israel-hating causes in the world. And ADL has defended George Soros repeatedly. So uh, we have a lot of work to do here. I appreciate your words very much. Uh, we disagree on the margins on certain things. We both, I can say, love Israel care that Israel should live and survive and be prosperous and, and uh, uh, be safe. And uh, we have to organize to have people call out the organization Black Lives Matter, not the movement for racial justice, but the organization's platform is horrible. They've never announced uh, their platform. Uh, in fact, it's still on the website in different areas. And uh, they still, to this minute, to yesterday, attack Israel as killing uh, Arab babies and Arab children. Frightening. Verbal violence will lead to an effusion of Jewish blood. That is our history. I'm very nervous and frightened about what's going on. We have to get more Jewish leaders speak out against Black Lives Matter, not condemn ZOA for exposing their platform. Exposing hatred doesn't make you a hater, for God's sakes. And more, thank you so much for your participation. Let us also remember that Jewish lives matter too. And any organization that demeans Jewish life should not be leading any movement for equal rights. I, I just want to thank you more for your tremendous commitment to Israel. I feel good knowing that you're out there fighting for us. 
I condemn those people who want to ostracize you. I don't agree with you on everything, but that's fine. We disagree agreeably. I respect you, and I thank you for all that you've done. And I just want to end it with this. Please <laughs> tune in to our Shabbat celebration. I'd like you to see a different way of celebrating Shabbat. Go to the, the Congregation of the Door to Door website, and you can see what we do. We're extremely, extremely pro-Israel and also extremely pro-science and reason. And I'm gonna leave it with this. It was Benjamin Netanyahu who said, do not think that I would be the last one to support a Palestinian state. I would be the first one to support a Palestinian state if they were to renounce violence and wanna live in peace with us. We must remember Israel is bent over backwards, even given the Gaza to the Palestinians to have a state, they turned it into a terrorist camp. We must do a better job at PR in explaining that Israel wants peace. We love peace, and we just want a partner that we can have peace with. But until the Palestinians renounce violence and renounce their insane desire to destroy Israel, they have forfeited their right to speak out in favor of a Palestinian state. We will reject any discussion of a two-state solution as long as one of those states is a terrorist state. More, thank you very much. Everyone else, thank you for joining us. And I hope that you'll, we'll be seeing you in the future. Thank and thank.